Okay, perfect. So I think we are ready to get started. Um, so hi, everyone. I would like first like to wish everyone a very happy new year and a very warm welcome to the launch of the winter edition of Founder Fundamentals, hosted by YSpace and the Markham Small Business Center. I'm Diana San Hussein, I'm Marketing and Events Coordinator, and we are so excited to be able to relaunch this series to you all. Now, our last version of the series that kicked off last fall was a huge, huge success with over 1,200 attendees who joined us from around the world, um, with almost 10% joining us from outside of North America. Now, the quality of workshops delivered surpassed a four out of five rating, and we saw so much interaction in each and every session. Now, we have so many exciting things in the works that I do want to tell you about before we actually start the workshop today. First off, last night, we celebrated our third YSpace anniversary, and we announced the extension of, y, of the YSpace brand to include the new YSpace Digital, York University's virtual incubator for students, faculty, alumni, and community members. Through YSpace Digital, we offer Founder Fundamental, Venture Catalyst, Idea Consultations, a virtual tech, a virtual food membership, as well as a tech accelerator and food accelerator. Now, applications will also be launched on Monday for the Wiseface Technology Accelerator, which is a free four month program supporting pre revenue technology ventures. We also have applications open for our Venture Catalyst program, which is a six week program for technology ventures to go from ideation to MVP. Now, if you have any questions about Venture Catalyst, we also have our Wiseface manager, Nafis, in the chat, who will be able to answer any questions that you may have about the program. We'll also be linking our website in the chat box if you'd like to learn more about any of these programs. Now, Wiseface has so many diverse programs to support entrepreneurs that are completely free and open to anyone worldwide. Um, so I really do encourage you to take advantage of all of the resources that are available to you. Now for today, we have a really great evening planned. And if it's your first time attending a Founder Fundamentals event, uh, we encourage you to type your name in the chat box so we can all give you a warm welcome. Also, I'd like to know where you all are joining us from today. So please type your locations in so we can see where everyone is tuning in from. So let's see where you all are joining us from today. If you can type your locations in, that would be great. Okay, so I see Tiffany from Muskoka. We've got GTA, Toronto, Brampton, Hamilton, Calgary. Uh, lots of people from Toronto. We've got someone from Florida. Welcome. Kansas City, Collingwood. A lot more people joining us from Toronto. We have someone from New York, Ukraine, uh, Waterloo. Ah, so we got Edmonton and then up to Nunavut. That's cool. Uh, we've got New Hampshire and Toronto again. So welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that you will stay with us throughout the series as well. Now, although completely virtual, the 11 workshops that we included in the series are really meant to provide hands-on learning led by industry experts and provide you with the resources that you can use to help build your startup. Now, those of you who attend at least nine, uh, nine workshops in the series will receive an Innovation York Certificate of Recognition after our last session has ended. Keep in mind that you must stay for at least an hour in each workshop in order for your attendance to be counted. Now, Zoom will be able to provide us with reports, so there's no need for you to do anything on your end. And all of the series are recorded and posted on our YSpace YouTube page as well. Now, this series could not be possible with the help, without the help of so many people working behind the scenes. And I do want to take a minute to acknowledge uh, David Kwok, who is the Associate Director of Entrepreneurship at Innovation York. Uh, David has worked really hard in this series to source a lot of the facilitators and topics that we have, and he will be in the chat to assist you with any questions that you may have. I would also like to thank our partners, the Markham Small Business Center for providing their support with the series. And I do wanna welcome their manager, Don, on screen uh, for him to say a few words. Hi, Don. Thanks, Anna, and thanks, uh, David and team. Um, looking forward to tonight's kickoff. Uh, you know, a, a good business idea always requires a solid business plan, and we firmly believe in that. 
Um, just a little bit about the City of Markham Small Business Office. We're uh, advisory services for entrepreneurs. Um, the one sort of program I want to make sure everyone's aware of here, because I, I noticed in the chat there are a number of people who are uh, coming directly from or, or are students with York University. Uh, we are in the midst of accepting applications for a great program called Summer Company, which provides grants of up to $3,000 for entrepreneurs to um, launch their business ideas uh, between school terms over the summer. Um, I'll put something in the chat with the information, but um, just just uh, consider that if you're planning to take this idea that you have and, and turn it into a, a serious uh, real business and, and generate some revenue and income for yourself, uh, I would definitely encourage you to check that out. And uh, again, it's a, a, a government grant opportunity for up to $3,000. And for those of you in Markham, I'd love to work with you. Uh, if you're not in Markham, the program's delivered province-wide and, and you're welcome to connect with your local program provider, but um, please uh, feel free to connect and ask questions afterwards. But the, the application requires a solid business plan. That's the only way to get considered. And so uh, I think today's session with Faria is gonna be very informative. Um, and you can even leverage uh, you know, funding from different sources if you've got a great business plan, including from Futurepreneur. And I'm sure Faria will talk a little bit about that, but. Um, don't limit yourself to just one program here or there. Use your plan, leverage it for other opportunities. Uh, there's numerous pitch competitions that happen. I think, you know, this is a foundational element of, of getting your idea really launched and, and continued to, to think about those opportunities going forward. So, Diana, thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, happy to be here and, and glad to support everyone. <clears throat> thanks for the mention of the link, David. I'm going to plug the um, information as well. But... Um, Please uh, enjoy tonight's session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Don. Yes, lots of resources available to you all. So hopefully you all do take advantage of them. Um, now for today's session, we do have about, I see about 85 people in the session, which is really, really great. Um, because so many of us are here together, I ask that you keep your mics muted. Um, if you do have a question, you can raise your hand. So under reactions at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a raise hand function. So you can use that if you have a question or you can type it in the chat box as well. Um, feel free to unmute your mics after you've raised your hand and ask your question or we can read out your questions as well. Um, so either way works. Um, so now I would like to welcome our speaker, Faria Wali. So Faria is the Business Development Manager at Futurepreneur Canada, where she collaborates with partners in our ecosystem as we help entrepreneurs launch and grow their businesses. She facilitates workshops on digital marketing, customer discovery, and business planning. And she's also an entrepreneur with specialties in experiential event and digital marketing. Welcome, Faria. Thank you, Diana. Um, happy 2021, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all this evening. Um, so as Diana mentioned, um, I am from Futurepreneur. So I'll share with you a little bit about who we are in a little while. Um, I want to acknowledge um, Don as well. We have a really strong partnership with uh, the Small Business Enterprise Centers um, across the province especially with um, the Small Business Center in Markham. So uh, it's a really great resource for all of you. Find your local center in your area. They provide really great advisory services um, and they can help you along with um, collaborating with us while you are going through this business planning process, okay? So all the things we're gonna talk about today, as Don mentioned, the business plan is such a valuable tool uh, for you to take with you in your entrepreneurial journey. So it's not just one document uh, that you write one time and that's it. It's gonna be very fluid. You're gonna kind of iterate it as you go. You're gonna take it with you um, throughout your entrepreneurial career. So I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, I'm an entrepreneur first. I love my job at Futurepreneur, but running my own business was an experience like no other. I've had um, a few successes as well as a few failures as well about things I should have done differently um, in terms of um, some operations, some planning ahead that we're going to talk a little bit about as well. Um, and I'm also um, marketing, a marketing gal too. So we can spend a lot of time um, talking a little bit about some marketing activities and things, some things like that around your business. Um, I want to really have this as a collaborative session today, not just me talking to you for two hours about, you know, my slides and things like that. So please do ask your questions. Use the raise hand feature um, in Zoom with the little reactions button. 
um, feel free to unmute yourself when you're called upon um, if you feel comfortable. If not, you can just type your question into the chat. And then at the end of the session as well, we will do a little bit of a Q&A for any kind of catch-all questions that we didn't get to throughout the session. If you feel comfortable sharing about your specific business, please do. Um, I would love to hear about kind of what you guys are working on and things like that. Um, we're located in the Toronto area. I am the business development manager responsible for York Region and Durham and the surrounding area. Um, I live in Richmond Hill, so I'm, I'm kind of in the area, um, but we have business development managers across the country um, for to meet the needs of whatever city you are in or whichever business um, or whichever area you're gonna run your business out of. Um, I'm a York U alum too. So for all of you students uh, out there, um, I'm, York U was my, my old stomping ground. So kind of nice to, to be connected with, with you all again. Um, so we can get right into it. Again, don't be shy, ask away. Um, feel free to interrupt me. Diana will interrupt me as well as we go with that little raise hand feature um, for everything that's gonna be um, talked about today. We're gonna do some breakout rooms as well, maybe one, uh, one breakout room as well. Um, and we're gonna do a poll. Let's get started with the poll, just so I can get a flavor for kind of where you guys are at with your business and, and, and then we'll get right into it. Okay, so everybody, majority of you are just getting started. Some of you have like, some ideas brewing and a few of you have already launched, which is really cool. And if you don't have any ideas that just yet, that's okay too. Um, this will benefit you um, when you do decide on what you want it to work on. Okay, how am I looking there? We're all good? good. All right, cool. So I'll start off by sharing with you a little bit about Featurepreneur. So we are a national nonprofit organization. We've been around for, oh, I think next year is like our 25th anniversary or something. Um, so we've been around a long time. We are a government supported organization and we provide financing, hands-on support and educational resources to entrepreneurs between the ages of 18 and 39. Now, if any of you in the group today are young at heart and you don't meet our age requirement, that's okay, you're still in the right place. All of our educational resources that we provide at Featurepreneur are available to everybody, even if you don't go through our financing program, okay? Um, if you are still in the, you know, looking for financing and you don't meet our age requirements, that's where Don can assist. Um, that would be reaching out to your small business enterprise center uh, to find out a little bit more about the resources and the things available in your specific area. So for today, the business planning process that we are gonna go through, um, again, available and applicable to everybody, all entrepreneurs looking to start a business. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about um, entrepreneur, but we're gonna spend most time on the business planning piece. Uh, so our main program at Futurepreneur is uh, the startup program. We provide a collateral free, personally guaranteed, unsecured loan of up to 60,000. That's our main kind of bread and butter. With that, and the really unique and cool part about our program, uh, we have mentoring. So everybody who has a loan with us is matched with a mentor, an experienced entrepreneur who has run a successful and profitable business. And that person acts as a sounding board or an advisor to you as you grow your business in the first couple of years. So it's a really cool and unique part of our program uh, that we're really proud of. This is our impact. Uh, we funded more than 13,000 businesses in our two decades. Um, and my favorite, favorite uh, stat on this slide is that 46% of our businesses are supported by, or, or sorry, are majority owned by women. So 46% of the businesses we support are majority owned by women. So all you female founders out there in the room, uh, please keep pressing ahead with your business, get it launched. We love to wait for perfection. Um, and in the entrepreneurial world, good enough is probably pretty darn good, um, especially if you are um, the, you know, searching for perfection. So I want you to spend a lot of time on your business plan, yes, uh, but put it out there let everybody know what you want to do, and let's get this, uh, this number uh, increased there. So Futurepreneur has a lot of business resources, again, available to everybody. If you browse our library, there are so many really great articles about, you know, the pandemic right now that we're in, um, you know, the way to approach your business legally with partnerships, what all that looks like. There's a lot of Futurepreneur success stories. We're going to talk about a few to, um, tonight. 
And of course, our business plan writer. That's our main tool. Diane is going to send you over the link um, after the session today. Create your own profile. We don't get to see it. It's a safe space. Work through your document there. Download it as a Word doc. Um, you know, make it your own. And the cash flow template as well is also found in our resources section. So our entrepreneurship pathway, we really take you from ideation straight through that business plan creation piece. Um, and at Futurepreneur, we have a lot of resources and people to help you do that if you are interested in our programming. This is what the business plan writer looks like when you log on. All of the content I'm gonna discuss with you today, um, we won't be sending out a slide deck per se. Um, so feel free to get a pen and paper handy and take some notes. But the business plan writer is really gonna take you through all of the sections that I'm going to share with you today as well. Okay, so don't worry, we're gonna to touch on all the information. So I wanted to lead with a question. I wanted to kind of throw this out there and if anybody feels comfortable, please unmute yourself. Um, why do you think a business plan is important? I, uh, sorry, this is Kartik from Calgary. Hi there. Um, hey, um, I, for anything, for any goal without a plan is just, a, I don't know, a dream. So it's same thing goes with the business plan, I guess. Uh, to reach a goal, we have to have a plan. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Cool, absolutely. It, it helps us uh, kind of identify what our goals are for our business. Um, anything written down is gonna help you get there a little bit quicker than just talking about it, absolutely. Anybody else wanna share why they feel a business plan is important? I think it shows you've done your research. Mm -hmm. Market research is a very, very important piece, absolutely. I see Benadia has her hand raised. You can go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Bernadia from Jacksonville, Florida. I think a business plan is important because it's like your navigation roadmap. I think without a map, you have no idea where you're going. Um, and if you don't plan the map strategically for a course, you're bound to run into dead ends, um, have business accidents and things of that nature. I think it's a great tool to have so you can know where you're going, know how to revise, revisit, reevaluate, restructure in order to execute um, in business very well. You got it, Bernadia. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. So your business plan is your roadmap. It is your, um, your, your, your tool that you're going to carry around with you as you go through the business planning process. It gives you a 360 snapshot of all the pieces of your business. Another reason a business plan is important is we are all experts in something, or we all simply enjoy doing a one part of our business and we hate doing another. The business plan is going to hold your hand through doing all of it. Um, for me, I'm a marketing gal. I love that piece of the business plan. Some of the other stuff I found a little bit more grueling, like figuring out my legal structure. Some of the accounting stuff is very meh um, and I don't love it. So obviously I'm gonna spend most time on my marketing section and some of the other parts may, may get a little bit neglected. The business plan forces me to go through all of the sections, even the ones I hate, um, to give me that roadmap um, to make sure we're planning ahead and we're keeping our uh, you know, accidents or hiccups at a minimum. So I really like that analogy, uh, Bernadia. Thank you for sharing that. I see that Lisa has also shared in the chat. Uh, she says it can also help communicate to potential investors what your business is about and how you plan on generating revenue. Absolutely. So the business plan, as much as you're writing it for yourself, I, I think this is why you should be starting with the business plan process. Um, it's a really great tool for lenders if you're looking for financing, to for investors. This is why you're gonna wanna share in your business plan as much of your personality as you can. It's a pretty long and intense document. You wanna make your personality and your passion and purpose for your business shine through the document. Um, our business plan writer has a lot of really great examples. You can even cut and paste into you know, the document, some of those examples. I wouldn't recommend the cut and paste feature. You really wanna start writing and letting your business idea flow and grow. Um, and then it's, it's, it's really gonna show us you know, the happiness behind and the business you're looking to create. So definitely let your personality shine. And also keep in mind that this is a fluid document, okay? It's gonna change immensely from the time you start writing it to the time you even launch your business. You may even have a completely different document from the time you get started to the time you're actually uh, putting a product into you know, your customer's hands. 
So this is the five stages of planning that we are going to go through tonight. Um, one, it's your company profile and the value that you're gonna be providing to your customers. Your market research, of course, is your understanding of your customers and what their needs are. Your marketing, how you're gonna find your customers. Your operations, how you're gonna keep them and fulfill your promises that you've made uh, to your customers. And then of course, how much money are you gonna make? Are you making enough money to be profitable? Okay. Um, I just wanna watch my time here. We could probably take a little bit of a break in at about seven-ish. Ben, if you wanna tell me when it's seven is. Um, I just realized I don't have a clock in the room. Yep, I'll, I'll let you know. Cool. Just so we can take a little bit of a break. And don't worry, you don't have to hear me talk uh, talk on and on without uh, getting a little break there. So the company profile, this is stage one of your business. These are the things that we ask you for in this first section of your business plan. Keep in mind, when you start writing your business plan, there's no rules. You don't have to write it from stage one to five. You can bounce around. You can do the things you love first. You can do the things you hate first. So it's really up to you. There's no rules behind how you need to approach it. Um, what's important on this page here? Um, a lot of these things are going to be specific to your own business, like your location, your, your structure, uh, you know, if you have a partnership, what all of that looks like. Your goals and objectives are the really fun part. That's where you can daydream a little bit. We want to see those big dreams. Um, as entrepreneurs, when we share our ideas, especially with our friends and family, people will look at you like you're crazy or, you know, just smile and nod and humor you a lot. As an entrepreneur, you're gonna get that a lot. But here is where you're gonna share your ideas and the people reading this document are gonna really understand you and get it and understand the vision and where you wanna take your business. So dream big in your business plan as well. We wanna hear all about it. Don't be shy uh, in that respect. Now, the really important piece to stage one is your compelling value. What is the value and the benefits of your business that you are going to provide to your customers that maybe they're not getting right now in the market. What are your cu customers, um, where are your customers going for your product or your service? And what are those gaps you're gonna fill that they're not getting from the competition? Your compelling value of your business is gonna really be where um, you want to, to shine, okay? So why, is your, why should your target audience choose you over the rest? That is really what you want to, um, to look at it here in this section. Faria, uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. I see that Bernadia has her hand raised. Bernadia, you, do you have a question? Yeah, with the first slide, when I was looking at um, the finance and long-term um, stuff, uh, with my business, it's more so nonprofit. So with these same, um, with these same aspects uh, work for this as well. Absolutely. So you would look at profitability from um, a different perspective. You're going to look at um, how much are you going to make to give back. Great. Okay. Okay. So look at it from that perspective. Thank you. No problem. So your compelling value, that's what uh, strikes me on this in, in this stage. And this is really where you're going to spend some time. Even if you're, if it's a business that, you know, you don't have to be innovative or, you know, invent something new, this could simply be how, what, it, what are you providing that's special for, you, for your business? So I wanted to ask you all to share with me an example of a company that you feel has a really strong, compelling value. It could be anything from a product you use today uh, to a product you really love or a service that you use, um, big or small. We have some people in the chat. Uh, so okay. Amazon, Airbnb, Apple, Amazon Prime. The usual suspects. Have we all shop, did, did some online shopping this week? I know I did, probably from all of those places. We've got Uber, Tesla. Tesla, that's a that's a favorite of a lot of people, absolutely. Sephora. Sephora, was that the last one? Yeah. Okay, what's Sephora's compelling value? Because they have a lot going on. <laughs> now, okay, we have some shy ones in the group. That's okay. So I would say Sephora, what they're trying to do is create a premium brand. So when you think of Sephora, you think of access to some premium brands. Uh, some premium, popular, trendy brands. Um, if it's hot in the cosmetics and beauty space, you're going to find it in your Sephora. That would be their compelling value. They're providing you with um, an aggregated one-stop shop um, of all of the cool and latest brands that are out there. So um, 
right now, there's nobody doing it like they are. They don't have the partnerships and the agreements um, with all these brands all to, to get it all in one place. Um, and that would be kind of their differentiator for their business for sure. Um, some of the usual suspects, Amazon Prime, absolutely. Um, we're probably all shopping on Amazon Prime versus the competition because we can get things quicker. I want my, I want my order in a day. I can't go to the mall. I can't pick it up right now. Amazon Prime is going to be the next best thing. Okay. Although we should be shopping local and supporting small business, but that's a, that's a session for another day. Did we have any other um, interesting things in the chat, Diana? Or should I uh, so we have DoorDash, Estee Lauder, Good Food Estee Box. Estee Lauder. Okay. They're all right. DoorDash, absolutely. Any of those um, brands right now with online delivery services, their compelling value is that they are all um, pulling at our heartstrings because we're all sitting at home and, and we need stuff at our door. Absolutely. Um, We've got uh, Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, all businesses have a compelling value, but I don't know what would be so particular about, about uh, Tim Hortons. Uh, a few more. We've got Zoom, Quest Trade, Wealth Simple, Khan Academy, Poshmark. Okay, cool. So I'm just hearing about all your favorite brands. Cool. So basically, all of these brands that you guys are sharing in the chat, they're all speaking to you for a particular reason. They are all giving you something over the competition in those industries. Um, you know, Tim Hortons, perhaps some of you gals, guys and gals out there are have an affinity towards a community um, that Tim Hortons has created or, you know, Canadiana, Hockey Moms um, atmosphere. So that has some, been something that they have done really, really well to pull on, um, you know, the heartstrings of us Canadians in the wintertime, especially. Um, some brands that you've all talked about, the usual suspects, Uber, Tesla, they've all been really cool at innovating and taking you know, usual everyday things we do in, in life like taxi rides or driving around and they've taken it to a 2.0 next level. So the question with compelling value is what are you gonna do to 2.0 your business? The customers are really gonna wanna gravitate towards you and your product. So Miri has her hand raised. Miri, do you have something to share? Hi, yeah, I couldn't locate my headphones earlier. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was just going to share as far as Sephora goes, I think that uh, one thing I would add there is they've got an incredible uh, digital presence and also their in-store presence highly um, focuses on curating that customer experience through technology. So when you come into the stores, I know now with COVID a little different, but you can um, easily try the the products on in a digital sense so without even putting anything on you can kind of visualize how it would look on you and that's uh, an incredible sort of advancement and something that consumers are looking for absolutely absolutely i think i've actually tried that as well the you know you take a picture of your face and you can actually try the products on on your phone um, they have really done a great job of, of 2.0ing their business they've merged technology with something that is very hands-on and that is why they will see success through um, the pandemic and, and what's going on today. I wanted to share a futurepreneur success story with you. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about food businesses now because they, they are pretty prevalent uh, right now, especially because a lot of them have been hit hard uh, with sorry, the pandemic. Before you move on, sorry to yep. interrupt. Um, Go ahead. I have a, a question in the chat from Lisa. She just needs some clarification and she's asking uh, by confirming by compelling value, do you mean a differentiator? Potentially, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A differentiator and what gap are you filling over the competition? So we, in the business plan, you're gonna be asked to put, uh, put down a SWOT analysis of your competition um, as well as for yourself, for your own business. And uh, the, your SWOT analysis are your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. And where you can fill the gaps for your competition's weaknesses, um, that is what's going to compel your, your target audience to, to try you out, to use your brand and to use your service over the competition. So absolutely, um, it, it definitely is a, is a differentiator and um, those key benefits in your value proposition. 
would be your compelling value. Okay, so Ed's Bread, this is a Whistler BC based company. Um, they were a brick and mortar location for about a year prior to the pandemic. Uh, when COVID hit, they were completely shut down. Um, and, you know, their, their business was pretty, hit pretty hard. So this happened to a lot of food businesses, um, sadly, and the ones that survived were the ones who were able to, to pivot, okay? Um, within a couple of weeks uh, after closure, Ed's Bread was able to pivot with an e-commerce model um, that where they were able to have a delivery and pickup uh, one day, same day service, not to compromise the quality of their product. Yeah, as you can imagine, bread probably tastes the best freshest, especially for a product like theirs. They needed to make sure that they weren't compromising the quality while still being able to service their customers. So this is an example of a really cool success story uh, that we've seen here, oops, that we've seen here at Futurepreneur. And we're going to talk a little bit about, sorry, can you see my screen okay, Diana? Okay, yep. so we are gonna talk a little bit about some of these food businesses and what they mean in terms of the business planning process. Part of our business plan here at Futurepreneur, and I'm sure going forward, it's gonna be a staple in all business plans is going to be, how are you going to mitigate COVID? Um, what happens in the case of a pandemic? How is your business gonna power through um, a shutdown? Um, I think that it may be a staple in the business planning process going forward. Um, so this is going to be something that we can, we're going to talk about a little bit today as well. The second part to, does anybody have any questions about Ed's Bread or, or anything like that before I go on? Okay. No, Fanny. So stage two is the market research piece. This is the part where you are going to make sure you share with us in your business plan everything you know about your industry. We want to hear about it in the broadest sense. What's going on in the industry right now? Who's in it? How does it work? Um, if you are in a very niche industry um, with some very specific things happening, you may not be able to translate that um, well to just the average reader of your business plan. You're gonna have to dive deep and, and share with us a little bit more um, context, okay? So keep in mind, this industry piece is really important. We wanna hear all about kind of What's the context? What's the environment look like surrounding your business um, that you're, and, and including locations and all of the good things going on in the industry that you're about to, to do business in, okay? We wanna hear about the local market. Again, the local area in which you're gonna serve. We'll tell us a little bit about what that looks like as well. And then this is where you're gonna include who your competition is right now. That SWOT analysis piece, um, your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We ask for about three to four um, competitors. And you want to talk a little bit about similar size businesses. So when we asked about the compelling, compelling value question, we got Apple, and Tesla, and Tim Hortons. Um, we don't want to hear about the big guys, the big guns in, in this section. We want to hear about some similar size companies and brands. If you are selling toothbrushes, for instance, you have a lot of competition in the market. But what makes you special? What makes you niche? Who are your comp competitors in that space? Yes, everybody may be selling on Amazon, but Amazon is not a competitor of yours. Their marketing dollars and their resources are far greater than you could probably you know, have access to, in, especially in those early days of business. You're gonna wanna look at some of those similar size, smaller brands who are using Amazon as a tool, okay? For even something as universal as um, toothbrushes. We're gonna talk a little bit about that a little bit later as well. Um, and how you need to approach, approach your business um, in that way. So try to keep your key competitors small and similar sized as your business. Who is your target market? Is it gonna be business to business, business to consumer? Sometimes it's both. We want a breakdown of how that's gonna look for you, okay? Here at Futurepreneur, we don't necessarily talk about your target market. We wanna hear a little bit about your best customer. So within this piece here, we'd love to hear about your niches. Who is your niche? Who is your special, small, small segment in, or group of people who you are going to target to sell your product to? If you are selling toothbrushes, everybody is not your target market. That is not how that works. 
we need you to pick a particular group of individuals to validate your business, to get your sales going, to focus on. Um, whether that be, you know, I'm just going to sell toothbrushes to students on campus. Um, and that way you can tailor all of your marketing activities and all of your sales initiatives to that one group of people. That'll give you the best sample of, you know, data about their buying behavior. Um, they'll give you the most focused feedback on your product and your selling techniques. Um, you'll get a lot more valuable information if you pick a niche in those early days, okay? Now you're gonna to wanna to pick your best customer. So here at Futurepreneur, one of our entrepreneurs in residence, he's a, he's a Pilates goer. So he loves to tell the story about um, being the only male, the only gentleman in a Pilates studio of 20 to 25 women um, in any given class. We're pretending that we're allowed to do Pilates again here. So what ends up happening is our entrepreneur in residence, Dominic, is sitting in his Pilates studio and it's just him. The Pilates studio now has to think about what their marketing initiatives are going to look like and who they're going to be targeting. Yes, they have males attending their sessions, but the majority of their business is tailored towards women. You're going to want to pick your best customer. It won't be everybody who uses your product. It won't be everybody who's going to buy um, or use your service or buy your product, but you're going to want to pick um, the majority of who you're looking after at that particular time. Okay, this is just help you stay focused and again, pick that niche as you get going with your business. So what you'll do here after picking your best customer, that is how you will figure out how you're going to market to them and figure out the best ways for customer retention. So creating ways and channels to reach those customers and to keep them coming back and to keep them happy. It's going to be a lot easier than going out to try to find new business constantly. Okay, it's going to be a much easier play. We'll talk a little bit more about some market research techniques as we go um, as well. So back to Ed's bread, knowing you, what you know about you know, uh, market research now and your compelling value and your stage one of your business operations. Um, Ed's bread is an interesting product um, to be selling. It's very, very specific and niche. Um, what are some of the common traits that you think Ed's bread um, best customer would have? Who are they going to be targeting um, out there? Families. Families for sure. Do we have anything in the chat? We've got Company, adults in the chat. Companies that sell bread based. Cool, yeah. They can have a wholesale um, revenue stream, absolutely, where they're selling to other stores around them. Um, but who is the who is the Ed's best customer? Who, when Ed and um, his business partner are sitting down talking about how they're going to access, you know, their customer, who are they thinking of? What type of person are they thinking of? So there's a few things in the chat. Amanda says artisan bread lovers. Jessica says moms. Okay, cool, absolutely. Lisa says foodies in surrounding area. John says the same, foodies. You got it, you got it. So you wanna think about your product and that compelling value your, and those differentiators that you've identified in those early stages, in stage one. Um, Ed, Ed's compelling value is that he's a premium product. He is um, a premium product. They're hand making their bread. They're selling it fresh every day. Um, they're going to charge a little bit more than you can get at your local grocery store. Absolutely. They're probably, I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're using, you know, whole ingredients, maybe organic ingredients as well. Um, they're really putting a lot of care into curating the types of, of ingredients they're using in their product. Um, so their best customer is really going to value those things. They're going to come in at a little bit of a higher price point. So they have the means to spend a little bit more on their bread. Absolutely, they probably have families too. Um, they could be moms who maybe value wellness and health. Um, their best customer is definitely gonna be um, people who value uh, these premium artisan items and as well as foodies, absolutely. So when you are looking at how you're going to um, reach out to your best customer, you're gonna wanna figure out where these types of individuals are living, working and playing. And how are you going to access them? 
perhaps um, farmers markets may be a really good option for Ed's bread because that's where a lot of these moms and these foodies are, are going on their Saturdays and Sunday mornings. Um, that could be an opportunity uh, for them as well. Any sort of um, whole foods types of environments uh, where people are really valuing um, shopping on a regular, shopping with these food items on a very regular basis, um, some premium grocery stores, maybe they're in a Pusateri's or um, a Whole Foods rather than um, an Oprah's and a Loblaws. So those would be um, where you want to find your best customer, okay? Once you identify a little bit more about what your compelling value is, you find out what's 2.0 in your business, who is purchasing your items, and where are they living, working, and playing. And that brings us to sales and marketing. So once you've identified where who your best customer is, you have to figure out how to reach them. What are they doing? What are their activities um, that they're doing? Um, are they soccer moms? Are you going to catch them on their way to, you know, driving their kids around to activities, things like that? Um, are you going to be targeting women who are attending the Pilates studios and have that free time on their hands? Are you going to set up a booth at a farmer's market because you know that your artisan product is going to be valued by the customers and the shoppers, you know, who are, who are attending the market? That's really going to, want, going to be what you want to focus on in this section. So your marketing strategy, yes. So pricing is very specific to your industry. That's where you should be researching competitors and things like that. Um, industry trends, um, taking into consideration um, your product and the value you're bringing. So almost everybody can probably charge an online delivery fee right now and people aren't gonna complain about it because we don't have a lot of choice in, in, in the game. Um, that could influence your pricing strategy, kind of what's going on in the world right now. But here with your marketing strategy piece and picking your top marketing activities, we're gonna do that as a group as well um, in a little, in a few slides. You're gonna to wanna to really look at your marketing activities in a very specific way, okay? We see a lot of business plans that come through a uh, featurepreneur and they just say social media. That's probably a given for your business. 9.8% of, you know, 9.8 out of 10 businesses are going to be using social media as a channel, um, a marketing channel. We want you to drill down a little bit further. We want to know exactly what platform you're using and <clears throat> what you plan to spend on that platform. This is uh, the part of the business plan where a lot of entrepreneurs really underestimate an ad spend. If you are, have no experience with AdWords or paid ads, you're gonna to wanna to do a little bit of research to find out how much goes into an ad that can really convert into sales. They have so much information out there right now about conversion rates and what industry trends are in the digital ad space. You're really gonna to wanna to spend some time there to make sure you are appropriately budgeting for a, a, a realistic amount of of money to make sure that you are really gonna convert those customers that are seeing your ads into paying customers, okay? So we want a lot of really detailed and specific information about exactly which platforms you're using and what types of marketing activities you're going to be going after. Another really important piece here um, is gonna be your sales process. We wanna hear a little bit more in your business plan too about what your sales cycle looks like. From the time your customer engages with your brand in an ad, for instance, to the time they actually reach out to you, we wanna see what that sales process looks like. We wanna make sure that it looks seamless and you're actually giving your customer a really great and seamless experience. If it gets too complex, your customers will never seal the deal and make a purchase. If they are bombarded with too many emails or ads or retargeted ads, that might be off-putting, they may not wanna come back. So you have to really hash this out in these really early stages and kind of practice and envision what this is going to look like for you um, and for your brand as you start to engage with your customers. And another really great one here are your strategic alliances. Your strategic alliances are going to be your partnerships in the community who are really going to help take your brand to the next level. They are going to be the people that are going to be helping you um, really get your brand out there and referring you and introducing you to, to other people. This is where you can put, if you're in a word of mouth business, like you know, fitness, um, personal training, 
um, medical services, if you're a chiropractor or physio clinic, all of those, if you're in salon services, beauty services, those are all really important word of mouth types of businesses. Your strategic alliances are gonna be really important. Um, who is going to be promoting you um, to your potential customers. So this is gonna be where you're gonna to wanna to spend some time. Faria, we have a question in the chat from Rodney and he's just wondering what the uh, 2.0ing refers to. Yeah, okay. So when I uh, you know, talk about the 2.0 of your business, um, I'm mostly referring to businesses that are really not inventing any, anything or innovating any, in any sort of way. You're just really, you found yourself a really cool product that you wanna market um, to, to individuals. Um, but you want to do it with that compelling value piece. It's really how you're taking your brand or your service um, with your, your benefits and your differentiators, and you're promoting your product and your service against your competition to your customers. You want to show your customers that you're the 2.0 of whatever they're currently using um, at the time. That's what I refer to when I say that. Okay, you want to kick it up a notch. Um, against your competition, even for those businesses that are pretty, pretty standard issue. Um, so I wanted to take you guys to a breakout room now. So networking is a really huge part of entrepreneurship. And I really do feel there's value in meeting like-minded people. Entrepreneurship can also be really lonely too, especially these days when all we do is stare at a screen all day. Um, I want you guys to go into a breakout room for about, how are we for time there? Okay, and I will time is it? So we're at 6.51. 6.51. So let's go in there for about five minutes and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some things before we take a break. Um, introduce yourselves to your peers and share a little bit about your business and your business idea if you have one and if you feel comfortable. And I want you to discuss a food business. And a food business, I mean, perhaps a restaurant um, or a takeout business um, and how they may have pivoted during the pandemic and what their top three marketing activities would be. So if you are a food business or a restaurant, think about the DoorDash and the Skip the Dishes orders that you've ordered in the past few months. Um, think about those businesses. What would some of their top three marketing activities be during the, during the pandemic? Uh, and then a couple of you can share when you, when you get back, okay? So it's an introduction to your peers and talking about some marketing activities, really specific marketing activities for any sort of food delivery food business that may have been delivered to you in the past, uh, in the past few months during the pandemic. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to assign everyone to a breakout room and I'll set the timer for five minutes. Cool. I'll see you guys in a few minutes. Cool. I think everybody's back. We're just getting back. Amazing. So was everybody okay with that time or was it too long, too short? Did you get everybody get a chance to meet each other? I think Hi, it was too short. <laughs> too short. Hi, Chantel. Hi, Faria. I see my girl Chantel up in here. I had to say hello. Chantel is a business coach. Um, so she's all about, you know, improving herself and learning about business plan techniques. So thanks for being here. Anytime. I'm here to support you. You know what it is. <laughs> um, Yes. Okay. So it was a little bit too short. Okay. Um, oh, and you guys are coming up with some great ideas. Great idea. Awesome. So I wanted to take the opportunity for you guys to introduce yourselves. Maybe we should do that in two separate groups so we'll know for next time. I think networking, again, as I said, is such a huge piece to entrepreneurship. It can get lonely out there. Please connect with as many people as you can. I don't think we have the power to introduce you all to each other and share information. If you feel comfortable doing so, you can go ahead and do that with, with your peers. If you have taught, found, you know, really um, insightful um, comments from your peers or if you have anybody who's in similar industries as you are. Now, a little bit about the ideas surrounding the marketing activities. Um, did anybody wanna share? Feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself, share a little bit about those marketing activities um, that you think a food business uh, should, should engage in during this time. Did Hi. Wanna... Hi there, Brittany Ann. Yeah. Um, right. One of the businesses that we talked about um, in my breakout room is a bit untraditional, but it was actually HelloFresh. And one of the things I found with HelloFresh is that it offers a fresh um, 
fresh take on takeout food, whereas it's not fast food, but rather it's um, healthy food using um, wholesome ingredients that you yourself um, cook through mm-hmm. the recipe. And I felt that for the brand, it was not only offering you de- delivery, so grocery free experience, um, it was teaching you a skill. And it's also like the very own online cookbook. So it has the recipes that you follow. So I feel that with that brand, um, it caters to a lot of millennials who don't cook, mm-hmm. as well as people at home who need something to do to entertain themselves and to also the opportunity to learn a new skill. And that was very beneficial for them during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So what type of marketing activities do you think they should engage in to reach their, their best customer? In this case, millennials, as you mentioned. I would say like a cooking classes, um, definitely posting on blogs, areas where you would find young people, definitely um, online websites where you'd see people do a lot of online shopping. Like for example, if someone's ordering knives or mm-hmm. baskets, um, for example, like thinking of a good like website to like buy ads would be like home goods. Mm-hmm. For example, that's something that would be beneficial for them to get that target audience. Cool. Brittany, and I love your, your idea about partnering with um, a knife company to, to advertise on their website. That would be a really strong strategic alliance, especially now that we're all at home, people shopping you know, in, in that space, in the home, home goods space. Uh, that would be a really great uh, marketing activity. Absolutely. Um, does anybody want to talk a little bit more about just kind of some general marketing activities for a food business during this time? Hey, I can do that. Yeah, go for Jay, it, Jay. Yeah. Yep. So basically, I, I didn't discuss about any existing businesses. I was talking with my colleague, Kim, about an idea that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what ideas I'm working on is uh, it's you have to book your meal in advance for lunch and dinner, like one day in advance minimum or seven days in in advance maximum. And you will get your food around lunch hour and you can pick your lunch hour because some organization have lunch hour 12 to one, some have two to three Mm -hmm. and five best quality and best food available around the community will be delivered to your doorstep with very reasonable price. Mm -hmm. Mm So one of the things about marketing that I, uh, I'm thinking is to f- work on the uh, focused customer segment who can order food in advance as well as who can uh, think about saving money and getting uh, higher quality food with less price compared to DoorDash or Skip the Dishes. So what would one of your marketing activities be? Uh, one of the marketing activities is like... A, a, like advertising in uh, okay. schools and universities, like university uh, residential areas and uh, universities where you see uh, international students or students from different province who will be there and they will, like students will think about saving money. Okay. And, and then marketing same uh, same service into the industrial area where you just get Team Hortons or a and or, or okay. just- Okay, so what would the activity be? What is the specific marketing activity going to be? How are you going to reach some of those students? Yeah. So first step specific marketing activity will be like uh, posters across the university and in the bulletin board, then uh, like flyers in the industrial areas. Like every city has some specific industrial areas and promote to install an app. Once they install an app, then they'll start getting notification. Hey, you know what? Today is Thursday. Tomorrow is Friday. Friday, we have a Chinese food, sushi, a Thai, Thai noodles uh, with chicken and all other options. And we have a special promo with our Indian restaurant in nearby community. They can provide a meal for two person with $15. So with, wow. that will be- So a Jay, you, you hit on a, a few activities that are very specific. That's exactly um, the purpose of the exercise. So I love that you said, um, in-app notifications. That is definitely a very specific marketing activity. You're going to get yeah. a lot of data from that as well for those of you who have um, apps uh, that you're thinking of, of launching. Um, experiential marketing activities like hanging up posters, handing out flyers, um, passing out flyers to local businesses in those communities around your food business. That's also going to be yeah. a really effective tool when, we are, when we're able to do that. So thanks so much, Jay, for sharing. 
Does anybody Thank else, you. we can we can have one more um, person share some of the activities that you talked about in your group? There's a few things in the chat. Um, so cool. uh, Nikichi, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If I didn't, I apologize. Um, so she's saying doing a virtual walkthrough. So cooking some meals together online. Um, and she also had a suggestion uh, from Jay's comment is bringing some samples on campus when open because um, students tend to be picky, very picky with food. Um, another suggestion from Annie was HelloFresh um, guides her child to cook in different ways as well. Cool, absolutely. So um, I really like the idea of somebody um, sampling. So let's pretend that's allowed. Uh, if you are looking to open any sort of food business or have any sort of food product, sampling is gonna be really, really important. Um, this is more along the market research piece rather than the capturing um, customers, uh, mar you know, marketing activity, but it is still really important. You wanna make sure that if you are looking to start a food establishment that you're testing your menus um, simply by asking for feedback on how they taste. This could be at community events, this could be at a friends and family barbecue. Um, it doesn't have to be large scale, you just need to make sure, and that's the first thing we're gonna ask you for when we're reading your business plan. Who are you getting feedback and testimonials from? If you are an e-commerce clothing line and you are, have just gotten your samples from your wholesaler in South America, um, you know, try on the clothes, that's great, but also have your best friend try on the clothes. Have her wear an item, have her wash the item and provide you with all of that really great feedback on your product. Same way with a food business. If you are looking to sell a very niche or premium product, for instance, I spoke to an entrepreneur the other day who is um, curating really fun, cool brands of ice cream. Um, she is going to be sampling those ice cream flavors at her next friends and family gathering when that's allowed, um, only because she needs to capture some of that feedback and testimonials that could potentially be heard from, from, purchase, from customers who are going to be purchasing her product. Okay, so make sure you're getting feedback and testimonials, even if they're from um, friends and family, okay? Friends and family are totally legit testimonials to get for your business plan um, as you're getting started. So just before we move on to the next segment, um, uh, we have a question. What tips do you have for starting a landscaping business? Uh, so a landscaping business is one of those word of mouth types of businesses. You're going to want to get your feedback and testimonials by way of Google reviews or, um, you know, taking pictures of the work you've done, creating a little bit of a portfolio. If that's, if the homeowners are going to allow you to do that, those are going to be the types of things that you're going to do. Some strategic alliances with, with landscaping businesses as well. Perhaps you can partner with local um, stores who sell, um, you know, garden garden things, garden centers, um, to see if they would be interested in promoting your brand or um, you know, leaving your flyers out, things like that. Um, landscaping businesses are also pretty location-based. You may wanna do a direct mailer, um, some door to door sales, things like that. Um, and then of course, once you've completed a project, ask your, your homeowner if you can leave a line, lawn sign up for a few, um, you know, for a few days. If somebody sees the really great work you've done, they're gonna to wanna to give you a call or the neighbors are gonna to wanna to talk, to talk to them about it. It's a very word of mouth business. Um, any tips for getting into fine jewelry? Um, I don't have any tips specifically about fine jewelry. Um, it's not an area um, that I'm too familiar with, but if you're looking to start any business, your market research piece is gonna to wanna to start with two things. You're gonna to wanna to start with your vendors and your suppliers. Where are you sourcing your product from? And what does that look like? Uh, you may wanna start with some pricing there too. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to see exactly what your minimum quantities need to be when you're looking um, to start a product-based business uh, because you wanna be able to crunch some numbers. You're not gonna be blowing it out the water with sales right off the get-go, right off the bat. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your minimum quantities are still enough where you can make some margin and you can make some profit on those early sales. Okay, the next side that you're gonna to wanna to talk about um, are your customers. Who are some of the customers? What type of, what, who's your best customer in the fine jewelry space? Who are you gonna be targeting? Um, and where are you gonna reach those, those customers? I almost feel like too, depending on how premium you're going, you're gonna have a lot of word of mouth in your business as well. Okay, depending on, on what that looks like for you. Nikishi is, is giving some really great advice there. 
um, linking your similar business so they can refer reference you for the job. Absolutely, absolutely. Any tips for biodegradable takeout containers? Again, that is gonna be one of those wholesale types of businesses that you are going to want to make sure your costs um, are pretty good in terms of minimum quantities, your relationships with your suppliers and your vendors um, and those manufacturers you're getting those takeout containers from, you want to want to have some really strong connections um, in that space. Okay, the um, stronger your sales and your validation um, piece are going to be, your, those test sales in those early days are really going to set the tone for some of those quantities and minimum quantities you can order. So back to the market research piece, once you have identified a little bit and we were talking, getting into it just a, a little bit there, you're going to want to do some more some more research and these are some tools of how you can do that whatever industry you're looking to get into whether it's a product or service you're going to want to visit your competition this is going to be back to filling out those SWOT analysis that we talked about visit your competition try out their product visit their establishment um, this is going to be your best research because this is going to be where you're going to find out what they're doing good or what they're doing well rather and what they're doing not so good okay you're going to see where you can fill in some gaps and what they're doing well, maybe some things you want to emulate as well, okay? Interview successful people in your industry. If you are really lost and you're not sure what to do, but you're really passionate about your particular industry, you're going to want to interview successful people who've done it, who've done it well. Chances are, if they reach a certain level of success, they're not going to be threatened by you. People who've done well really love talking about themselves. They probably will sit down with you. And if you have questions regarding the industry um, and, and learnings and people talking about, you know, learning from people's failures, people are going to want to be open to that. I would say nine out of 10 people you ask to have to have a chit chat with or sit down with to get their experience, they're going to be okay with talking to you. Okay. Um, so reach out to your network. Networking is going to be so key to the success of your business. Surveying potential customers um, and how to conduct a customer survey. Um, this could be by way of, you know, sending out Google form, which is not as ideal, um, could be, you know, posting in Facebook forums, if there it's a particular, you know, community of people um, who are interested in your niche, um, you know, throwing a couple questions out there just to get people's reactions, um, and maybe their own experiences. Um, mommy blogs, for instance, if you're looking to launch a product in the baby or children's space, Mommies love talking about their experiences with their kids um, and, and certain products and things. You can get a lot of market research done just by visiting forums, blogs, um, and places anywhere, places, any places where you can comment um, and have a little bit of a back and forth um, uh, from your co potential customers. And of course, when we're allowed to do this again, there's also trade shows, there's specific association meetings for any professional services out there, um, things of that nature. And then, you know, know the question you want an answer to. This, this, this statement, I agree with in some respects and I don't agree with in others. Sometimes it's really just talking to people in your industry and getting insights. You don't have to know the question you want an answer to. You're just information gathering and that's going to be okay. You may learn a lot from things you never even thought to ask about. Um, just simply by having a really nice and casual free-flowing conversation with, with somebody in your industry or somebody who's seen success in your particular space, okay? Um, this is another success story that I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, Go Oil. So they, you may have seen them on Dragon's Den actually, they are a featurepreneur supported business and they went from uh, one location to, I think they're now on their 12th franchise. I think it may even be more than that. They are a mobile oil change company um, so they come to your to your home or to your place of work and they change your oil for you in your car. This is a really, really great business. It has recurring revenue. We all have to change our oil. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, I, I don't do this one in the house. Um, every few months you have to change your oil or every few however many thousand kilometers. Um, it's recurring revenue because once you get going and somebody really enjoys your business, um, you're going to keep calling them back. It's just easy to do that. The next a part of that is this is a probably a word of mouth type of business as well. If your neighbor sees somebody coming to change your oil in your driveway, they're probably going to give them a call too. Um, this is just one of those businesses that you can have some really, really great, sustainable, steady income from. Um, and they've seen a lot of success 
uh, with their franchising model as well. So this was a really cool success story that I was really impressed with. Um, I believe these guys are, are, are based um, out west as well. And they started their first business uh, with a futurepreneur loan. So we're at stage four or five now. How are we for time, Diana? Oh, we're good. Okay. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the session as well. Um, yep, we just good. have a couple more stages to go. This is going to be your operations section um, of your business. Now, this may be where you're, you guys have to contact Dawn and your small business enterprise sector. They may be a little bit more helpful in this area than we can be. Um, but this is going to be where you're going to want to have, um, you're going to want to work through some of those legality and regulatory items for your business, such as how to register your business. Are you a sole proprietor? Are you going to incorporate? Are you a partnership? Um, partnerships, by the way, um, you want to make sure that these are done in, in very clear cut ways. You may need um, legal to assist, especially if you're working with close friends or family members. Okay. Um, Believe it or not, business can turn everybody pretty sour really quickly. So that's my offline advice to you um, in, that, uh, in that regard. But legal issues and regulatory items, you're gonna wanna look at that a little bit closer. If you're professional services or if you're a, a higher risk business, you're gonna wanna look at your insurance issues especially. With Futurepreneur, we require that all of our businesses have liability insurance before we disperse our loan to you. Okay, so you have to have that sorted. A lot of um, insurance companies will talk to small businesses um, in these really early stages. You could probably get a good idea about what would be required um, of you, um, you know, in that respect, and maybe even get some quotes to crunch some numbers that way in your cash flow. HR, what does that look like? Chances are you're probably not hiring a huge team in these early stages. Chances are it's probably just you doing everything, um, but this may be something you want to consider um, if you have, you know, a need for staff if you're opening up a restaurant, for instance, and things like that. What does that look like? Are you following Ontario labor laws? All of that sort of good stuff. And then of course your process and production, similar to the marketing channels that we wanna hear a little bit about in your, in your sales cycle. We wanna hear a lot about your process, your process and your production and your business plan. We wanna hear all about your order fulfillment and what that looks like. Everything from your relationships to you with your suppliers to how, what, you know, how you're servicing um, your customer and fulfilling your promise. We want to hear exactly what that looks like. We want to be able to read it and picture it in our mind what that seamless um, customer experience is going to look like from a process and production perspective. If you're an online e-commerce store, what does it look like from the time they press, they put something in their cart um, to the time it arrives at their door? We want to see what that looks like for you and we want to see that you've thought about all of those things, um, you know, along the way. And then of course a risk assessment. We require a risk assessment anyway as part of a business plan from a marketing perspective, an operations perspective. Um, and we usually ask the question, um, I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but how do you know when to call it on your business? How do you know when to shut your doors? That's a really tough question to, to ask uh, yourself, but it's one that you should probably do some soul searching with in these really early stages, um, just to make sure that you are you know, preparing a little bit for you know, some worst case scenarios, which isn't a bad, a bad thing to do. Um, with this risk assessment, again, now at Futurepreneur, we are asking everybody for a COVID risk assessment as well. What does your business look like, especially if you're a brick and mortar, if you have to shut down? What does your product-based business look like um, in terms of fulfillment? Is there any interruption to your, to your sales cycle, your production cycle because of COVID? Um, if you're professional services, what does that look like for you? Do you provide online services only? That's great. Um, do you uh, have a, a protocol in place, you know, for when your door is open and, and you can see clients safely? What does that look like for you as well? So we're going to want to hear a lot more about this. Um, I think, I, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be an area of the business plan that's probably here to stay. Aria, we've got two yep. questions in the chat. Uh, the sure. first one is from Nicolette. Um, so she's asking what the difference between partnership and corporations for two people in business together. Yeah, so your corporation, if you have more than what, like one partner or owner of the business and you've incorporated, you're gonna have shareholders. So your shareholders are gonna, you're gonna split the shares of your, of your business and of your ownership structure under a corporation. And then a partnership, um, you may be um, just registering. Um, as, a, as a regular business, as you would a sole proprietor. 
um, where you're just splitting the, the equity of the business um, in a little bit more informally, I guess. Um, again, those types of things. I don't know if there's a session on that, uh, Diana, as part of the, the series. Um, if not, um, you could seek um, out more information from your small business center about those, those types of nitty gritty with, with the government um, related things. Yeah, we do have a legal session that we have coming up later. Perfect, perfect. Save that question for, for that person, absolutely. And the second question comes from Julia. Is it a good idea for a startup to seek interns from post-secondary or contract knowledge experts? That depends on your industry and it depends on your business. I mean, um, and is it cost effective? That's the first thing I would ask you um, as, a, as a new business. Can you afford it? Um, I don't know if unpaid internships are, are allowed any, any longer. Um, so if, if they're not, what does that look like for you in, in, in terms of your cash flow? Um, so that would really be, be business specific. Cool. Were there any other questions? Oh, nope, we're good. Cool. So we're gonna go on to stage um, five in a little bit. This was another success story that I wanted to share with you. Um, this was a really cool business. Uh, that I thought was interesting because it took um, what would usually be your typical uh, physio clinic rehabilitation center and they took it, they 2.0'd it. This is what I mean by um, they've taken their business to the next level. So this, they're a rehab clinic in Southwestern Ontario um, in Owen Sound. So they offer physio, chiropractic services um, like any other chiropractic clinic which I think is very cool, totally fine business. They're not reinventing the wheel at all. But what their compelling value was for their customer was that they also incorporated yoga and fitness into their center and offered family services. So your whole family could attend this rehabilitation center and access these services. So the really neat part about their business model is they're extending the lifetime value of their customers. So if I'm a parent and I'm going here for my physio and, or my chiropractic services, and they also have opportunities for my kids to come along with me to get some fitness and wellness in there, that's great. Um, but it would be a really great way for these service providers to offer their services to the kids as well. And then all of a sudden you have, you're servicing four members of a family, um, you're servicing and working with the kids in that neighborhood, in that area, who are going to grow with you as your business grows. Um, so you've increased your client base potentially by two or, or three or four people um, that you wouldn't have otherwise done if you were just your usual physio um, and chiropractic um, clinic. So I thought this was a really great way to 2.0 your business um, and to increase your revenue streams and the lifetime value um, of your customers. Okay, um, so stage five um, are the financials. This is the part where I think most entrepreneurs get a little bit nervous. Um, but I think for me as an entrepreneur, whenever I'm looking at a business idea, I start with my financials first. So here at Featurepreneur, we have what's called a cash flow forecast. The cash flow forecast is uh, located on our website. Um, it's going to be in one of the links that Diane is going to send you as well. It's a really user-friendly Excel spreadsheet. I mean, you could do this and set this up every way, any way you want. If you are interested in our Futurepreneur application, this would be a requirement, um, but it's a really great exercise to go through first to simply see if your business is going to make you money um, or how much money you need from an investor, from friends and family, from your own savings to invest into your business, to get it going, to see a profit, okay? All 24 months of our sales, um, cash flow projections rather, uh, need to be in the positive. We need to see that you are crunching your numbers in a way where you are always going to be uh, making money. It doesn't have to be a huge amount every month. It just has to be in the positive. So you're going to want to approach your business, um, sorry, your cash flow forecast like your business bank account. If you've gone into the red, it means you've run out of money. Okay. So managing cash flow is an entrepreneur's, I think, sore in, in our sides because you, your business is going to uh, really dictate what this looks like for you. So for those seasonal businesses, if you're a landscaping company, you may have crazy, crazy, amazing sales in your spring and summer months, and you see nothing in those winter months. Um, so how are you going to mitigate that 
Are you going to offer snow removal services to, to you know, compensate? Are you going to have enough savings and investment into the business to float you for those few months that you don't have um, any contracts? Some businesses have clients who pay in, you know, 60 or 90 days. What does that look like for you in terms of your sales cycle and your cash flow? So this is a really great tool for you to work through all of those cash flow woes um, for your business, as well as determine what your startup costs are going to be to see how much money you need to get your business off the ground. So we've got a question from Jay in the chat, and he's just wondering, uh, should cash flow be done for a year or five years? Our cash flow should be done for two years. Um, that's our requirement. Me personally, I think doing a cash flow for five years is a little bit um, unrealistic. Five years is just such a long time um, for a new business. Chances are what you plan for year two even may not even be what happens. So um, I think five is, is a lot. Um, it could be overwhelming. Um, two to three may make a little bit more sense. We have another question from Ankeet. And how's the best way to forecast sales for cash flow analysis? This is the million dollar question, literally. Um, sales assumptions are really, really hard to do. So what we tell our 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 entrepreneurs rather, are to really spend a lot of time on that market research piece and that marketing piece. So if you have your top three to five marketing activities that we talked about earlier, if you have them budgeted and you've done enough research where you know exactly how many um, customers you could potentially get from all of the outreach you're doing, you'll be able to forecast your numbers a lot better. Uh, with paid ads, there's so much data out there. If you run an Instagram ad and your conversion rates are looking like for your industry, they're looking about 1%, you could probably make some really solid sales assumptions based on how much you're spending on those ads, for instance. Okay, um, some other sales assumptions techniques you can do are um, accounting for that seasonality, um, accounting for inventory. Uh, some of you e-commerce fashion businesses uh, for instance, if you're doing inventory um, orders three times a year, um, you have to make sure that you are selling through at a proper rate. Um, and then, you know, perhaps you see a bump in sales after you replenish your stock or you add new products. Um, that's how you can account for those types of sales. Make sure that in your cash flow, you're accounting for um, a lot of that seasonality um, and, uh, and that marketing. Uh, if you are running a marketing campaign and you're doing a really big push for the holidays, of course, you're going to see a, re a really big bump in sales for Christmas. Um, uh, you know, so account for some of those type, types of occasions as well. If you are a product-based business or a business that um, shoppers are going to get excited about during those peak times. This is what your startup costs look like um, on your, your Excel um, cash flow forecast sheet. Um, this is where you can account for any sort of brick and mortar space, leasehold improvements, any fixes, renovations, things like that, business insurance, equipment. Uh, one thing I will say here, um, any initial inventory goes here as well. Your startup inventory only, not your replenishment. Um, another thing I'll share here is um, you should probably um, account for um, in, in your startup costs with your, you know, with these things, don't account for any personal items that you share with your business, okay? Um, it should be, for purposes of our application as well, this needs to be strictly business expenses only. So for instance, if you have your cell phone um, or your car and you share it between personal and business, it cannot go on your cash flow forecast, okay? It's not a realistic number for how much you need to get your business going. And then your cash flow year one, this is what this looks like. So in your sales assumption piece um, here at the top, I don't know if you can see my cursor, Diana. The little, the, the little arrow, yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. So your sales assumptions here are going to be where you list all your products or your services, your products by price range or your services, what they are. And here's where you're going to put your, um, your units and your number of items sold. You're going to multiply that by the average number of the sale. And then that's where you're going to get your sales figure for each month. Okay, so that's what this looks like. This is will be where you indicate to us what you are contributing from your own pocket uh, into your business. Um, and this is what you are going to be contributing going forward. Anything you've already spent is going to go on your past purchases tab. 
anything that you need to get started is going to go in your startup costs and that's going to be transferred over to this section as well futurepreneur bdc any other funding if there are any loan amounts or anything like that that you get if you join starter company and you're awarded um, the prize at the end that's where this goes in here as well that's where you can account for all of that um, and then of course you have your inventory costs only use your inventory costs if you actually have inventory for a product don't put things like your supplies in here even if it is a percent of your sales we have okay. another question from yeah. Jay, and he's just asking should we do a cash flow analysis for a small area first and then expand for the whole city. And he's specifically asking for the food delivery idea. Um, I think your cash flow needs to be for your business as, as a whole. You're probably gonna be spending money to get your app going um, for, for the business in its entirety. So your cash flow needs to reflect that, especially um, since it's two years worth. You're gonna be wanting to grow out of just your local region um, or just your niche or, your, or that target segment that you're you're looking after in those early days, it's going to really grow pretty quickly for you. So you're going to want to want to look at your business from a whole from a whole 360. Are there any other questions? Nope. Okay. So this is what your expenses look like here. Um, just a couple things that I'm going to highlight are uh, your owner's draw. Here at Futurepreneur, um, I may have met, may or may not have mentioned this already we need to see something in this area. Um, we need to see that you're running your business from a place of ease um, and you're having some fun. If you are putting financial pressure on your business, um, on your personal life rather, um, and sinking every last dollar your business makes back into your business, um, you're not gonna be happy, you're gonna run out of cash real quick and your personal life is, is not gonna be um, as enjoyable. We wanna make sure you're being set up for success as an entrepreneur. And in your entrepreneurial journey, you know, the starving entrepreneur who sinks every last dollar back into their business, I think is a thing of the past. You need to see that you're sustaining yourself every month. So this should be enough to sustain yourself, um, you know, pay your rent, pay your mortgage, feed your family. Um, it doesn't have to be huge dollars, but it has to be something in there. For all you students, I get the question, oh, but I live at home, I have no expenses. That's great, maybe start saving. Okay, put it in a little fun for yourself. We need to see that something is happening in this in this area here. Um, that advertising and promotion piece. Um, remember I talked to you a little bit about sampling. Sampling is an advertising and promotion activity. If you are giving away free samples to influencers of your product, if you are sampling your menu outside of your brand new you know, restaurant, that needs to be accounted for in your promotion piece to make sure you've accounted for that cost. And then of course, don't underestimate your advertising cost here, especially if you're doing paid ads, do a lot of research, even run a test ad on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is, um, run a test ad to see how your customers are potentially responding to you, okay? And then these other things here. Um, another one that I like to see populated in here that's not usually is any sort of software. Any sort of software you're using for your business, if you are a beauty establishment um, or even a professional services establishment and you're using a scheduling software, if you're using um, Square um, or any sort of payment processing and you have a monthly cost associated with that, make sure that's included here. Um, that's a really important one, probably one that's gonna be really um, prevalent for your business. Um, you know, it's 2021 after all. Um, and then your total startup costs are gonna be populated here from the first tab. So make sure that's accounted for as well. And then what's gonna happen is you're going to spit out a number at the bottom here that's cut off. That'll show you how profitable your business is gonna be and how much money you're gonna make month after month. Okay, so this cash flow exercise is really important. And I think one that you should spend a lot of time with um, when you're thinking about starting a business. And that's it for my presentation. Again, I'm here for questions. Um, this is my contact info. Um, if you're interested in our Futurepreneur program, let me know. Um, if, if, if not, and you have any particular questions that you wanna ask, please send me an email. I'll be happy to, you know, to respond. Um, and then of course, Diana is gonna share with you all of the information that I shared um, in, in some tabs and links, um, along with a link to our website. So if you wanna be contacted in the future, she's gonna share that with you um, as well. 
So yes, we have a question. Um, so yeah, everyone was concerned about whether there are, they will be getting a copy of what you just showed the the template. So that will all be sent sent off to everyone. Um, I do see one question in the chat, and uh, if anyone else has questions, feel free to type them yep. in or raise your hand, and you can unmute your mic. Um, Amanda is just wondering: um, Would you account for uh, retail costs if your business is in your home? Um, retail, maybe. Oh, is that a rental cost? You mean? Oh, maybe is that that retail or rental. Question. Amanda, if you are here, if you can unmute and, and let us know. Rental, yes, she clarified. <laughs> yeah, so that would be a shared expense and wouldn't go on your cash flow. If you're running a business out of your home, you can't share those expenses. And I believe it's the same for um, starter and summer company applications as well. Any shared expenses cannot be accounted for on both the cash flow, um, on both the cash flow for your business and your personal. And Donna's just wondering how is Futurepreneur different from Summer Company? Yeah, so our program um, is not really, it's not really, a, a, we don't provide you with the, the workshop aspect of it. Um, it's really for entrepreneurs who have done this business planning already. Um, of course, we help you along with that, but you have to come to us with a business model and a business kind of, you know, ready to go, ready to launch. You can definitely be pre-launch, but you have to come to us with that. Um, and then we are a loan provider. So we provide financing only. We don't provide any sort of grants um, or prizes um, with our program. And we do accept rolling applications. So all year round, as long as your business has been um, pre-launch or been around for less than 12 months, um, you are good to go with us. And, and of course, our age range is 18 to 39. And another question is um, from Kenneth. Do you get funding to buy a franchise business? We provide financing, yes, to acquire businesses. That is um, something we do. Um, we do stay away from some industries um, that are just a little bit too risky for us. We don't finance um, tobacco or cannabis businesses, and we don't finance a lot of financial services. Um, but you can reach out to me to find out a little bit more about your specific business if you're interested. Okay, and another question from Jay, what are the major signs that a business idea is not feasible? The major signs that a business is not feasible is if you plug all your numbers into your cash flow and everything is red. Um, if you are not making money, that is when your business is not feasible. And that, this cash flow forecast exercise um, will really be a great tool for you to, to run, it, run the numbers uh, that way. If you are not making money, if chances are you don't have enough sales or your expenses are too high. Um, or both. So those will be things that you have to look at. How are you going to capture new business um, to increase your sales or how can you reduce, reduce expenses, um, you know, to bridge the gap. And another question is coming from Donna. What is the loan and interest rate? Yeah. So Donna, our maximum loan is 60,000. Our rates vary depending on, you know, on the time of year we fluctuate with the Bank of Canada. Um, so what our most recent, uh, our most recent information is located on our website, or you can reach out to me and we can talk a little bit more about our loan terms and, and all the specifics uh, for that as well. And I see another question here from Julia. What is the success likely for people starting a business while they have a day job? Yeah, so we have what's called our side hustle program. So this is a really exciting program. Sometimes it's just not feasible for you to quit your job and start a business. That's, that's for most of us. Or um, it's just not something you're ready to do yet, a little bit too, too daunting, and that's fine. Our side hustle program is meant for entrepreneurs who um, have a full-time job, who have alternate income, who don't intend to take their business full-time in at least a year. Um, it's a loan of up to 15,000, and we expect that you're running the business full full time or sorry, part time rather. Um, and you just need a little bit of money to inject into the business to see if it can grow um, from what it is. So there is definitely a lot of successful um, part time businesses that happen. I think um, your chances of success while you have a day job are really high um, because you're probably doing it from a place where you have the resources, you're not financially strapped um, and you're gonna enjoy that process a lot better. Um, then maybe some of us who are just taking a, a bit of a bolder risk and betting it all and, and you know, not having that full-time security of a job. 
And I see another question here from Sheriff. What is the ceiling for loans that you can provide for business finance? And his so our, business is for, sorry, exporting and trading food products. Exporting. So our maximum loan for our program is 60,000. And that is if you're running the business full time. Um, importing and exporting um, types of businesses, you'll just need to find out a little bit more about the licensing and any sort of regulatory um, things around that. Maybe Don at the Small Business Center can help you out with things like that. Um, from our perspective, we would need to see that you have those proper licenses and such for import and export types of businesses. Perfect. Does anyone else have any other questions that they want to ask? Feel free to unmute your mics or type them in the chat. I do have another poll, um, Diana, um, oh, yeah. that we can we can ask. And I just realized that I didn't give you guys a break. I totally forgot about that. So we were we were too busy having having fun. Okay, so let's launch the poll number two. You should see okay. it on the screens. So after all the information I just kind of gave you, um, how prepared do you feel about writing your own business? Okay, I will share the results. Okay, so I'm glad not too many of you feel completely overwhelmed. Um, and yep, somewhat ready, but I have some more work to do. Absolutely. That's how I feel about a lot of businesses I have on my deck right now, too. Um, so I'm really, I'm really glad uh, that I, this was helpful, helpful to most of you. Um, please utilize the tools that we shared with you today. Um, and keep asking questions. I know, um, in the chat box, somebody's asking how you can get a hold of me. So my contact info, Diana, you're gonna you can share my email address with everybody as well. Feel free to send me an email. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well, and if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, and do we suggest any books to increase our knowledge about working on startup ideas? Um, I do have a few in my library, but I would love to hear from other entrepreneurs. If you want to stick your favorite business books in the chat, um, you could do that. And, and, and share along for, for everybody to, um, to benefit. And my email will be shared with everybody in the email that you're gonna receive after the session today. Okay. Um, mentors, so our mentor program that we have with our program is available for anybody who has a loan with us. Um, if you're looking for mentorship um, on its own, um, our program doesn't offer that, but that may be something that your small business enterprise center can help you with and they can guide you in the right direction because you know Don um, specifically at uh, the Small Business Enterprise Center in Markham he'll have his ear to the ground on what's the latest and greatest in your community what's going on who what other organizations are out there what their offerings are um, so your Small Business Enterprise Center is going to be a really great resource for um, for all of the other things that Futurepreneur can't help you with. I see two people have their hand raised so we have Bernadia how about you go first? Hey, so I have a question. Um, looking at the chat in the beginning, I noticed, you know, everyone is from everywhere. Um, and I think I'm the only person on here from down south in Florida. So how do I become connected with the Small Business Center? Because it seems like you guys have a lot of valuable information. And I love the fact that you're not selfish with sharing it. <laughs> that's hard to come by um, down here in Florida. So oh, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. I, I I I don't know what the what the entrepreneurial scene is like down there. Um, but yes, so our resources are available to everybody. You're able to use our business plan writer, our cash flow forecast. Um, as far as benefiting from like our small business consultants up here and things like that, those are probably only for programs available to you if you live here. Um, you know, our small business enterprise program programming, um, I believe is provincial. So it's even only kind of um, uh, available to, to people who live in Ontario. Um, but again, all of the resources that we publish online and all of these webinars and things that we have, those are available to everybody. So please tap into those resources. Um, okay. And I really hope, yeah, do some more research. I hope you find like some centers down there in Florida with people who, who you can, um, Spend some time with. I know um, David just shared with you a really cool site. Um, okay. And then Don suggested you check out your local office of the Small Business Administration. Okay. Yeah. 
Perfect. And I see another question. Someone else has their hand raised. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your nope. name. I hope I'm pronounced, or I'll let you pronounce it and, and let us know how to say it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's not an easy one. Uh, my name is Bilal Makonjola, but you can call me George. That's much easier. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Yeah, so I had a, a question. You had mentioned that, you know, your your company shies away a little bit from like um, uh, financial services and stuff like that, because I guess they're a little bit risky. I just wanted a little bit of um, of an understanding about that and what the chances are with that, because that's where my business, that's the industry my business will be in. I see, I see. Yeah, so it just has to do with kind of money transfer, payment processing, things like that. Um, George, if you wanted to send me a quick email, I could, I could uh, find out for you a little bit more about your specific case. Perfect. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Any other questions before we sign off? Perfect. So Faria, I just want to thank you so much for sharing all of your insight today and all of the resources. Uh, thank you so much for, for really taking the time to teach us all about, you know, how to write an effective business plan is such an important thing to do. Um, so on behalf of the Markham Small Business Center and Space, thank you so much. Thanks for having me again. I'm really yes, happy to be here. Yes. Anytime, anytime. And to all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of Founder Fundamentals. I actually do want to remind you um, of some really great programs that we have that I mentioned earlier. I know a few of you uh, joined a little bit late, but that's okay. I uh, want to remind you about our Yspace Digital Technology Accelerator program that we are going to be launching applications for. Um, it's a great four-month program, and we will have all of the information up on our Yspace website. The link is below. And we also do have our Venture Catalyst program. Um, so that's a really great program. Applications are now open for that and closed by February 5th. Um, so, so many great resources for all of you. And I do want to remind you that we have... Uh, we're just at the beginning of, of the series. So we have a lot of great sessions that are coming up. Um, the first one, the next one that we have coming up is about Lean Startup Mythology on January 21st, and then followed by top five mistakes from a first time founder. Um, so lots of great workshops. Uh, just a reminder that you do have to register for each session individually. Um, so we do have all of them available on our website. Um, so I do want to thank you all for attending and hopefully we'll be able to see you all again next week. Take care, everyone.